Uh, good afternoon to everyone and thank you panelists for this opportunity. Uh, I was actually given a curious topic of yellow spots and dots that are spots around the macula. Now that's a heterogeneous group which actually we have a huge things. My life became easier when the first speaker talked about dot hemorrhages. The second speaker made it even better for me. So I could actually filter myself to white dots, which is more non-infectious than infections. So these are multiple whitish yellow inflammatory lesions, which are located sometimes in the outer retina, in the retinal pigment epithelium, in the choroid. And in this heterogeneous group, I thought we'll handle only these non-infectious, which includes the placoid epitheliopathy. Bird shots, I just made it only for the academics, but uh, we don't see bird shots in India. Mutes, then the multifocal choroiditis with panuveitis, then punctate inal chororetinopathy, serpiginous, and azure. Uh, I just wanted to mention that the dots can also be seen in the periphery like the Dallin fuchs in these uh, either sy uh, sympathetic ophthalmia or even in sarcoids over a time. Uh, so the differential diagnosis, uh, actually, if we look at, we look at sarcoidosis, histoplasmosis, pneumocystitis, choroidopathies, Bechet's, toxoplasmosis, sympathetic ophthalmia. Intraocular lymphomas is, uh, one of the main things that we look at right now, and uh, we also have the DUSN. So what is important in this is to differentiate between the dots and the spots. And based on that, we can actually classify whether it is large or small. And the large ones normally are the placoids and the serpiginous and the bird shots, and the small are usually the mutes, punctate, inner choroidopathy, and the multifocal choroiditis with panuveitis. Now the distinctive and shared features that we have in these are majority are seen under the age of 50 years, except bird shots and serpiginous, uh, mostly seen in women, bird, mutes, bird shots, and multifocal choroidopathies. Unilateral could be DUSN or even mutes can present unilaterally. And most of the other ones are bilateral. I must also give a caution that although these are distinctive and shared features, they are not absolute. So you can have incidences even less, more than 50 years and even less than about 18, 20 years. So I think age would not be a real big criteria and even gender sometimes might be misleading. Uh, the other distinguishing features are despite the white dots remaining similar, most can be distinguished by the history, the lesion morphology and progression Added to that are the ancillary tests of the fluorescent angio patterns and the OCT along with the autofluorescence patterns, both in the blue peak and as well as the near infrared autofluorescence. And yes, where you have the facilities, visual fields, whether a full field or a multifocal ERG would also help you to distinguish these. Uh, so individually, I would not like to spend much time because the, the placoid ones that I started, they do have a prodrome although the reasons are unclear, and they are typically bilateral multiple plaque-like lesions at the RPE or the choroid. Usually they have an early uh, block and a late stain on the fluorescent angio, but they usually fade away in two to six weeks in time. They rarely need treatment. Now, only if the prognosis is poor, which is associated either with a foveal involvement or an older age at presentation, unilateral disease, longer interval between first and second eye, recurrent diseases, and extensive multiple lesions, what we call as a relentless placoid retinopathy. These are cases which actually end up with a poor prognosis. Bird shots, actually, this entity is not common in India, and this is usually seen in the fourth decade in females, and this is mostly HLA-29 positivity, about 96%. But the HLA-29 I mean, HLA positive does not show an incidence in the general population. The vice versa doesn't happen. I will not get into much of this detail because these are rarely seen, but most of these need uh, immunomodulatory medications as a first line. Uh, 
Then we have the more common or multiple evanescent white dot syndromes, and these are usually affecting younger women, usually unilateral to begin with, and they could be bilateral. Unknown etiology, one third have a preceding viral illness history and small degree of myopia. And uh, on fields, you can get a temporal or a paracentral protomas. Ocular findings have very little inflammation. Uh, there could be small white lesions in the outer retina. And these could be ranging between 100 to 200 microns. And the macula appears very granular. Uh, I'm sure you can see the granular appearance on the right on the screen. And this is supposed to be pathognomonic of uh, the mute findings. And they do have an enlargement of the blind spot. Now, OCT typically in dots and blots, if you look at it, dots are mostly in the middle retina and the spots are larger and at a deeper level. And uh, it's actually very interesting that when you see these dots, uh, the mutes on the retinal surface, we actually think as the outcome is better, so we think it as a common cold of the retina. So it just happens and it goes away. And this is exactly what you have. There is a disruption in the ellipsoid zone in the deeper retina and it actually extends towards the outer nuclear layer. Uh, so fluorescent angiography, it actually shows punctate lesions and in a wreath-like configuration. And this wreath-like configuration is supposed to be pathognomonic for the mutes. Uh, I'll skip most of the other things in the interest in time. Uh, ICG also has a role in it where many mo more you know, lesions are seen than what you see on the FA and they are denser in the posterior pole and around the disc, and the clustering of these spots around the optic nerve is the reason for which you have the enlargement of the blind spot on the uh, uh, perimetry. Now, I think we'll skip this, and this is actually the visual field testing where you look at the enlargement of the blind spots, and uh, many of them are abnormal ECGs in the early phases, and they reduce in the dark adapted layer, I mean, oscillatory potentials on the multifocals. So the multifocal ERG response is a measure of the photoreceptor and the bipolar layer, and uh, the multifocal oscillatory potentials are the responses of the uh, reflected inner retinal function. So I was just giving you an example of how there has been a abnormality in the dark adaptation and the light things. You can see that the subnormal wave patterns. Uh, treatment usually is very good. You don't need much of it, and they could get back normal vision. Serpiginous is more the larger ones, and I think uh, this is also bilateral, but maybe asymmetric. Uh, the recurrences are very common in this lesion, and uh, uh, typically, you find them as a grayish-white lesion with serpiginous or geographic-like extensions in the posterior fundus, mostly near the peripapillary area, but they can be seen anywhere. Active lesions are actually at the edge of the atrophic scars, and CNV may occur in these cases, and the treatment responses could be poor. Fluorescent angiography, if you look at it in an early phase, you can see the hyperfluorescence at the margin of the uh, lesions and on late phases you can actually see them leaking. Multifocal choroiditis and pan uveitis are syndrome simulating the POHS, the chronic idiopathic inflammations, and they represent a spectrum involving a punctate inner choroidopathy and a diffuse subretinal fibrosis. Uh, please tell me when I'm overshooting. Yeah, I think so. Up. So do you want me to stop it here? Because most of the lesions. We'll conclude. You want me to wind up? Okay. Uh, I wanted to only highlight the punctate inner choroidopathy, which is an inflammatory disorder, and this is bilateral. There are punctate choroidal lesions in the posterior pole area. Uh, the follow-ups, uh, you can only realize this thing when you have a good serial follow-up, and once you document these cases, then you can actually find that 17 to 40% of the cases actually develop CNVs over time. This was one of my patients who actually was followed up for almost about five years, and we could actually see the CNV getting on at the end of it. Uh, then you have the 
multifocal choroiditis with panuveitis. And this is very salient. The PIC and the NCPs have very interesting differentiations, and I think you can just go through this. Uh, I'll just leave this in the interest in time. I'll just take you through the last slide, that even though they are white dots, it does matter to distinguish them one from the other, to at least feel what spectrum of disease they are, because some get better with no treatment, some with steroids, and some with immunosuppression, and some with a combination of all this. Uh, with this, I would like to thank you, and thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Murlidhar, with a very nice overview of uh, white dot syndromes, and I think these are one of the most exciting retinal findings which can end up uh, anywhere from an innocuous uh, MUDS or AMPP, or maybe some, some of them might end up uh, becoming, like, uh, developing into a full-blown VKH. So, but starting points uh, are just white dots, and what I can see, uh, some of the, uh, the audience are like fellows and people who uh, want to uh, take up this medical retina. I would suggest three things to them. One is collect, uh, have your own collection of these photographs, uh, classical OCT findings of different diseases saved with you. And whenever you see a complex case, try to match the findings to findings. Second is have a serial photograph and uh, keep them in, uh, on one slide and see what happens to them uh, over a period of time. And third, try to look into the, uh, uh, the number of layers involved, whether it was isolated retinal involvement or outer retinal layer or inner retinal layer, or whether choroid is also involved. I think the uh, dreaded disease which we can miss sometimes uh, is uh, viral retinitis and uh, foveal threatening, serpiginous choroiditis. Those are two uh, situations I can think of where if we you know, uh, not make a diagnosis correctly and confuse them with white dot, uh, the consequences can be dangerous. Maybe uh, Dr. Manav can add. I think autofluorescence can be can be an important investigation model in this type of cases that can give some added information. Can, can I can I make a small comment? Yeah, I was just coming to that. Yeah. I purposely did not involve autofluorescence much in this because uh, I was actually not knowing what was the audience. But in the interest of the audience, I can actually suggest I use normally two wavelengths in the autofluorescence regularly. Uh, 